2018. And here's the status. Actions taken. Progress made. Facing challenges. <laughs> No, Mr. Speaker, if action has been taken and progress is being made, will the government answer now, once and for all, in what year will the budget be balanced? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, it's sad to see that lifting hundreds of thousands of children out of poverty, that the Conservatives don't see that as progress. We on this side see that growing the economy and ensuring an economy that works for everyone is what we were elected to do and what we are delivering on. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to grow the economy. We will continue to invest in Canadians because we know that that's what Canadians Canadians elected, and we will not take lessons from the Conservatives who only want to help their millionaire friends. Member for Carleton. Well, not only should they take lessons from Conservatives, they're taking credit from Conservatives. The child poverty numbers for which they take credit actually start in 2013 and run through to 2015, during which time I was Minister. So I thank her for congratulating me on those successful reductions we did with a balanced budget because we know that helping millionaire friends is what happens when Canadians are forced to pay excessive interest payments to wealthy bondholders and bankers that hold our right. debt. Right. So, once again, will the government finally answer the question, in what year will the budget be balanced? Yeah. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, what lessons specifically would the Conservatives like us to take? Was it the lowest growth rate since the Great Depression? Was it stagnant wages like they had under their government? Was it sending checks to millionaires with the Canada Child Benefit, making it taxable? I don't know. That's not really a record that they should be proud of. On this side of the House, we have continual growth. We're seeing an increased investment, 80 percent more invest business investment than under the Conservatives' record. That's the type of growth we're focused on, an economy that works for everybody. This fall economic update is designed exclusively to work for the Liberal Party. Now, while the deficit is running out of control, they managed to find $600 million in order to buy themselves endless praise uh, in the Canadian media. They believe that the job of the media is to praise the Liberal Party and help them with the re-election in an election year, Mr. Speaker. And so, Mr. Speaker, let me ask this question. If the goal is really an independent media, why are they trying to make the media dependent on their government? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, this, this is insulting. It is really insulting, not to me, not to the government, but to the professional journalists. In our society, professional journalists plays a key role. It's one of the pillars of our democracy. So my question, Mr. Speaker, after attacking professional journalism, which other pillar of a democracy are they going to attack? Hello. Order, please. The Honourable Member for the Wee Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, it's Friday. I'm in a good mood. So let's congratulate the Government of Canada because they have a real sense of humour. In their economic update, this is funny. They have, they say that they're, they talk about their commitments and their accomplishments. Now, we remember, you know, they talk about progress made and now challenges to be met. Well, here's one, a commitment of deficit zero, but we have a deficit of 20 billion. When will they balance the budget? When the Conservatives were in power, they had an average GDP growth of just 1%. We, since taking office, have had an average 3% GDP growth, and that's expected to continue and rise. The Conservatives talk about their records, but in fact, their records 
Word is abysmal and they should be ashamed. When it comes to the economy, we know that real growth is based on investing in Canadians and as a result, they have created over half a million new jobs and wages are growing. That is what our government is focused on. Hello. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Louis Sandoval, Mr. Speaker, when Liberals took power, they had a budget surplus. The PBO said this, and it was the best surplus in the G7 countries. Three years later, what do we see? A deficit three times higher than projected. The question is, and the question remains, is there someone in this government who can tell Canadians when the budget will be balanced? The Honourable P Parliamentary Secretary. Don't let facts get in the way of the message they're trying to say. While Conservatives are focused on trying to rewrite history, we know they couldn't balance the budget, they couldn't grow the economy. But over here, we've created over half a million new jobs. A typical Canadian family next year will be $2,000 better off than they were under the Conservatives. So we know the investments are working and that we are focused on Canadians while they are focused on selling their failed plan to Canadians. The Honourable Member for Rimouski, Nejet, Timiskwata, Les Basques. The Prime Minister claims to be progressive. The Labour Minister claims to be a progressive. But Mr. Speaker, you cannot claim to be a progressive when your actions don't match your words. Right. A back-to-work legislation is not progressive, especially when it gives Canada Post, one of the worst employers in this country, license to bargain in bad faith. On this side of the House, we see time and time again that when push comes to shove, Bay Street Liberals always seem to trump progressive Liberals. My question, Mr. Speaker, when will the real progressives on the Liberal benches stand up to this attack on workers? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Employment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, obviously the, uh, uh, the work action, uh, when we talk about what's going on with Canada Post today, we understand that this is something that we don't take lightly as a, as a government. Uh, negotiations have been going on for over a year. Uh, we've had a mediator. We've been uh, trying to help with a mediator for over a year. We've, speci we've uh, appointed special conciliators. Uh, what we would hope would that be that the both sides are able to get down and get a deal done. That's in everybody's best interest. Uh, that's what we'd all like to see, Mr. Speaker. But uh, until then, we still hold out hope that uh, they can find that way forward. L'honorable député. The honourable member for Rimouski, Nejet. In 2011, when Conservatives had a back to work legislation. Mr. Speaker, mediation is a joke and one of the parties is bargaining in bad faith. That party is Canada Post. This legislation Liberals are bringing in will bring back previous working conditions, problems for health, safety, and equity. Now, we see that 315 workers will sustain injuries, that rural bill carriers will work unpaid hours, that urban workers will not will work thousands of hours in unpaid uh, uh, work. And Mr. Speaker, uh, the, the leader of the NDP would know that, uh, the leader in the House here, uh, would know that uh, the arbitrate it's a mediator arbitrator that is clearly identified in this legislation so as the workers go back to work the mediator will continue to be engaged continue to be uh, uh, trying to find resolution on those outstanding issues the health and safety is obviously one that uh, uh, that is of great concern and should be a gr of great concern to all Canadians but uh, uh, rather than an imposed arbitration and a final offer arbitration we the Honourable Member for Jean-Kier, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals say that they're defending the middle class, but with this legislation, they're preventing workers from bargaining with their employer. This is exactly what the Conservatives did in 2011 when the Conservatives did the same thing to workers. Here's what my Liberal colleague from Cape Breton Council said, and I quote, this legislation is not only far-reaching, but it's also malevolent. I'd like to know why it was malevolent under the Conservatives, and now it's become quite acceptable. Secretary. Uh, 
Mr. Speaker, uh, certainly, as, as I said, uh, the, you know, we're, we're, the legislation we're putting forward, uh, we're going to have a mediator and an arbitrator, and, and he will sit down with both sides, try to find a way forward. But, you know, earlier, uh, the member from Cowich and Malahat Langford had a very eloquent uh, piece on how they're supporting farmers. He might want to talk to Vessie C and, and see how this mail, how, how this strike has had an impact on their ability to get those seeds out to farmers. We're hurting farmers. This uh, tie-up is hurting small businesses in this country, and we're taking action to fix that. The order, the honourable member for London Fanshawe. Mr. Speaker, Liberals are bringing new meaning to the term Black Friday. New Democrats remember 2011 when Jack Layton led a filibuster against the Harper Conservatives for forcing CUPW members back to work without a contract. Since then, workplace conditions at Canada Post have only deteriorated. If the trend continues, workers will experience 315 disabling injuries in the four and a half weeks between now and Christmas. And it's on the Prime Minister's head. Why is he forcing workers back to an unsafe workplace? Is he totally without conscience? Yeah. Yeah. Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, obviously we know that we recognize that uh, there are some outstanding issues uh, and we hope that the mediator will be able to get both parties together and find a way forward. Uh, we, we've heard from, uh, we, we've heard from rank and file members that uh, they want to be back to work, they want to be doing their jobs. This is a busy time for them. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I would hope that uh, uh, there's still time at, at the table. They're still at the table. Let's see if they can find a, a resolution. But if not, we're going to take the action that's necessary to help those small business operators in this country. Have the Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister really doesn't have the right priorities in the economic update. There's been two years that we've been witnessing a border crisis, and Quebec and Ontario are paying for it. The government owes $400 million to Quebec, $200 million to Ontario, and yet the Prime Minister prefers to give $600 million to Unifor so that they can attack the Conservative Party. Where, do Quebec and Ontario have to beg for this money back? For border security. Mr. Speaker, we've been working very closely with our provincial and municipal partners in, in, in managing very effectively the issue of those who have come to our country seeking the protection of Canada. Those processes are being well managed, and we are working with the municipality. I'd like to take this opportunity as I rise to also acknowledge and thank the City of Toronto under Mayor Tory's leadership for their excellent collaboration. I've also recently worked uh, with Mayor Laplante, and, and the municipal partnership has been exceptional and needs to be acknowledged. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Fort Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, the fall economic update has done nothing for workers who rely on the energy sector to care for their families. The Prime Minister stands idly by and does nothing to address the deep discounts in Canadian oil. Yesterday, actual Canadians, not paid foreign protesters, took to the streets of Calgary to demand action. Right. Why did the Prime Minister even bother to show up in Calgary when it's clear he doesn't care about hard-working energy workers in the sector that we promote here? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, we deeply care about the energy sector and the people who work in that energy sector. We understand the frustration they're facing, but the source of the frustration is the inability of the previous government to build a single pipeline to expand our non-US global market. We are moving forward on uh, the Enbridge Line 3, which will become in operation uh, next year. We're working very closely with the province of Alberta to find solutions to the challenges the energy sector is facing. We have stood with energy sector workers, and we will continue to, to, continue to stand with them. The Honourable Member for Perth, Wellington. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General has confirmed that the Liberals have failed to take action to improve internet services in rural and remote communities. Rural businesses across Canada are disadvantaged, and families are continually frustrated by slow, unreliable internet service. There was nothing in the Liberal Fall Economic Statement to address this problem. Why is the Prime Minister failing rural communities? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Innovation. 
Mr. Speaker, on the contrary, we've taken significant action to connect Canadians from coast to coast to coast. The Connect to Innovate uh, program, Mr. Speaker, $500 million has resulted in 900 communities in rural and, and remote Canada being connected. That's 600 more than we had targeted with our initial group. Mr. Speaker, we take connectivity seriously. We know that Canadians need to be connected for economic and social reasons. We have, the, the, the minister has sat down with his provincial and territorial counterparts in October, and we, ha we will have a national strategy moving forward. Order. The Honourable Member for Caribou, Prince George. Mr. Speaker, the fall economic uh, update came on the heels of sweeping notices of work curtailment and mill closures in British Columbia and indeed in my riding. West Fraser, Conifex Timber, Tocal Industries, Canfor and Interfor forestry companies have all announced sweeping forms of labour force reductions. With Christmas just 32 days away, families are now facing tough choices. Why is this Prime Minister and this Minister neglecting the hard-working forestry families? Of natural resources. As the member would know, there's 100 million allocated for innovative practices in the in the forestry sector because we know that uh, the forestry sector is a source of well-paying middle-class jobs. It will remain a source of well-paying middle-class jobs. We will continue to support. We have provided $867 million to support workers and communities, diversify our markets, and help producers access services and new markets. The Honourable Member for Sarnia Lampton. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I asked the Health Minister about serious drug sh uh, shortages in Canada, and her answer was that the government has a web page where they list them all. Well, a web page does not get medications to the Canadians that need them. What's next? An app? Clearly, addressing the shortages wasn't a priority in the fall economic update. So why won't the Liberals take action to solve these chronic drug shortages? Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, it is my responsibility as Minister of Health to make sure that Canada Canadians be well informed about the medication they take. We have a serious issues with the shortage of certain medications. We have on our website information, and we're continuing uh, to add to it. The issue of a drug shortage is complex, and it's important that we work hard at solving it. Mr. Speaker, this spring, the Liberals tabled a so-called gender-based budget. But in the fall economic update, we see very little follow-through. So now, the Prime Minister actually spent 20 times more on swanky new vehicles that he drove for two days at the G7 summit wow. than he did on improving access to employment skills for women who are vulnerable, coming out of violence and needing a restart in life. Really? Mr. Speaker, why did the Prime Minister spend $23 million on his swanky new vehicles that lasted for two days and not even a drop in the bucket for women who need a restart? The Honourable Minister for the Status of Women. I reject the several premises brought forward in my honourable member's questions. First of all, there is proactive pay equity legislation in this fall economic statement. Secondly, the G7 was the first time ever that gender was mainstreamed through every single item of the agenda. Third of all, Mr. Speaker, we have been committed to advancing gender equality because we know it will grow the economy and our plan is working. If my honourable colleagues are con concerned about vulnerable women, why do they vote against every single measure we introduce to address it? Honourable. Honourable Member for Essex. If the Liberals care, then why are they jamming through back to work legislation? Yeah. Today, the Liberal government is violating the constitutional rights of workers. This is wrong. Postal workers are not getting paid equally. They're not working in safe environments, and they're working so much overtime that they can't get home to see their families. Today, Liberals are betraying working people, and when you come for one worker in Canada, you come for all of us. Just like Conservatives, they are siding with rich corporations and Black Friday profits by violating workers' rights. Why are the Liberals so hell-bent about forcing postal workers to return to an unfair 
and dangerous workplace. The Honourable Call Mr. the Secretary to Minister of Employment. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, it gives me an opportunity to sort of contrast the way that the Conservatives took this approach and the approach that we've taken. We've been engaged for over a year with these negotiations. We've uh, we've uh, appointed conciliators, special mediators. Uh, over the last four weeks, we've seen that. Uh, the, uh, the, the situation at Canada Post has had an impact, but with this legislation that we table today, it's a mediator, arbitrator. The mediator will continue to work with the groups to try to find a resolution. We know that the, the arbitrator that was appointed by the Conservatives was a, a failure. Honorable Deputy. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. With this special legislation, the Liberals. The Liberals are treating us to a sleazy spectacle of cynicism and political betrayal. In 2011, the Conservatives did the same thing. And one member said these extreme right ideologues are hamstringing the union, which is with uh, legislation that is unacceptable. Who said that? The member for Scarborough Guildwood. Well, if the shoe fits, then wear it. It was the extreme right when the Conservatives did it, and now the Liberals are doing the same damn thing. This is the true face of the Liberals. Elementary Secretary. Order. Well, Mr. Speaker, if we want to go with the sanctimony of the NDP, maybe they might want to look in the mirror. And why did the NDP government on, in Ontario legislate teachers back? The member from Fanshawe was, was a member of that provincial government. The member from Hamilton Centre, they were members. So there you go. Order. Shh. Order. The Honorable Member for Calgary, Midnapore. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have confirmed that Russia intervened in the 2015 Canadian election, but they won't give details. Mr. Speaker, Canadians have the right to know. The government must tell us the nature of Russians, Russia's involvement and who was targeted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we take foreign interference in democratic processes with the utmost seriousness and will continue to work to protect our institutions and our elections. With Bill C-76, we're putting forward the necessary measures to protect against foreign interference in our elections, measures to ban foreign funding as well as provide greater transparency in elections-related advertising by third parties and on digital platforms are key changes that will help close loopholes um, for, of foreign actors that have used other jurisdictions around the world. Let me be clear, Mr. Speaker, we will not tolerate foreign interference and will respond with the full weight of the law. Mr. Speaker, intelligence officials in the United States have released detailed reports on Russian interference in their 2016 election. There is absolutely no reason why Canadians should not expect the same level of transparency from their government, especially on an issue as fundamental as the integrity of our electoral process. So, I'll ask again. How did Russia interfere in the election? How extensive was the interference? And who was the target? The Secretary of the Minister of Democratic Institutions. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to protecting and defending Canadians' democratic institutions, which is rich coming from the party opposite, which is the party of, uh, that's been found guilty of trying to influence elections in three past campaigns. This is the party of in and out the party of robocalls, the party of Dean Del Maestro. We're protecting our strength and strengthening our democratic institutions, Mr. Speaker. Bill C-76 will do that. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Samiltamine Nicola. Mr. Speaker, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that American intelligence officials are actively briefing their allies on the dangers of Huawei. This should be a wake-up call for the Liberals who think that they know better. It is time to stop ragging the puck and make a decision. Will the Liberals stand with our allies and say no way to Huawei? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Innovation. Speaker, our government is open to global investment that will grow our economy and create good middle-class jobs, but never, Mr. Speaker, at the expense of our national security. 
when it comes to telecommunication services, we've promised Canadians that we would improve the quality, the coverage, and the price of their services no matter where they live. 5G is an emerging part of that 5G technology is an emerging part of that picture of service to Canadians. And we'll make sure that Canadians have access to this, this technology, but Mr. Speaker, not at the expense of our national security. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Milkamine Nicola. Mr. Speaker, Canadians want access to this technology, but they want to make sure that, that foreign interests are not getting access to that as well. The government has been telling us for weeks that their personal financial data of Canadians is safe to, with them and not to worry. Yet, they plan to allow a Chinese government-controlled company free access wow. to our internet infrastructure. Canadians care about their security even if this government does not. When will the Liberals do the right thing, do the right ban thing. Huawei from our 5G network? When? The Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, let me, let me correct the record. There, there, is a 5G, uh, pro, uh, there is a 5G program in place, Mr. Speaker, uh, led by a number of different companies, including Ericsson. Mr. Speaker, we will trust the opinion of our national security advisers on this matter. We will never compromise our national security. At the same time, we will be open uh, to investment through uh, the Investment Canada Act and other procedures that are meant to protect Canadians and see that we get value for money. Mr. Speaker, and our national security is never compromised. We trust our experts and we work with them. The Honourable Member for Berthier Masquin Angers. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals' back to work legislation is terrible, but the way they're getting it adopted is even worse. In 2011, at least the Conservatives let us debate the bill. Motion 25 from the Liberals is as if they're saying, well, we learned from Harbour's mistake, and so this time you won't, uh, as the opposition, won't have an opportunity to speak to it. We've got a day and a half to debate Motion 25, stifling debate, and three and a half hours to debate the bill. Why are the Liberals, like the Conservatives, forcing us to vote in the middle of the night to bring in legislation that violates, wor violates workers' rights? Mr. Employment. Well, Mr. Speaker, there comes a time when uh, a government has to take action, and that's certainly what we're doing here, taking action. We've supported the, both sides with mediation for over a year. We've, special, we've appointed special uh, uh, moderators, and uh, uh, what, what we're doing now, Mr. Speaker, it, it's funny. There comes a point when you've got to make a, a choice, and we know that the NDP have found that seven different NDP premiers have... 15 times have put back-to-work legislation on the and, and brought workers back to work. So, Mr. Speaker, that's what we're doing to try to continue to help small business and people. Order. The Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. You know, Mr. Speaker, the members pretending like the Liberals are just making this choice now. The fact of the matter is they made the choice a long time ago when they didn't tell Canada Post management to deal with the injury rate. They made the choice when they decided to do nothing when Canada Post cut off its sick and injured workers at the beginning of the strike. They chose to do this two weeks ago when they signaled back to work legislation. The government has been poisoning the well all along. So how dare they pretend that they just made this choice this week? It's not true, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I believe that the uh, efforts that have gone in on behalf of uh, both ministers on this particular issue have been exemplary. Over a year, we've been standing with both sides. We, be we believe in fair and balanced approach to labour relations. Unlike the past Conservative governments, Mr. Speaker, we've been with them. We continue to have uh, conciliators at the, at the table. Uh, negotiations are still ongoing, Mr. Speaker, and we would hope that they're going to find a way forward. But if not, we will enact this legislation, get everybody back to work, and get parcels moving in this country. Honourable Member for Ottawa West Nepean. A year ago, our government hosted the Ministers of Defence meeting on UN peacekeeping in Vancouver. It's UN peacekeeping conference. Our government committed to working with international partners to re-engage in peace support operations and to end the abhorrent practice of recruiting children as instruments of war. Could the Minister of National Defence update this House on our re-engagement on the world stage through the UN and our commitment to the Man Vancouver Principles? Well, Minister. Mr. I want to thank the member from Ottawa West Nepean for an important question. Canada is once again demonstrating global leadership that we are known for. Last week we celebrated the one-year anniversary of the United Nations Peacekeeping Defence Minister in Vancouver. 
A year later, I'm proud of the progress that we have made thus far, deploying our Air Task Force in Mali, which is conducting life-saving medevac uh, missions, launching the LC initiative, and Mr. Speaker, the Vancouver Principles, uh, aimed at preventing the recruitment and the use of child soldiers, which has now signatures from 68 member states. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mégonti Clérat. Mr. Speaker, the Minister has no plan to connect uh, Canadians to the internet, and I'm not the one saying it. It's the Auditor General who has had harsh criticism towards the government this week. The Liberals have failed, and Canadians, businesses, and farmers are patiently waiting to be able to participate in the Canadian economy at high speed. What's worse, the government remains silent on, on the issue in the, the economic statement this week. October 30th, 30th elected people from Megantic Lirab came to Ottawa to call for action. When will the Prime Minister give high speed access to all Canadians? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I was in attendance at uh, the meeting with uh, the elected officials from Megantic Lérable. We talked about our commitments and we described what we're doing. We're currently connecting Canadians across the country with the Connect and Innovate program. As I said, we targeted 300 communities across Canada. We connected 900, Mr. Speaker. And of the 900, 190 are Indigenous communities. We are currently connecting rural and isolated communities across Canada and will continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This Liberal government promised to connect rural Canadians with broadband. But the Auditor General recently said that they have no plan. We knew that, but he confirmed it. They have no plan to bring high quality internet services to Canadians in rural and remote areas. Let's take Chris Yo. 15 kilometers outside of my city of Saskatoon, he knows the frustration of unreliable internet service. When will the Liberals explain why they don't support Canadians participating in the 21st century economy? Here, here. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, on the contrary, we are working very hard to connect Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Through the Connect to Innovate program, which invested $500 million across Canada, Mr. Speaker, and leveraged, leveraged over a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker, in partnership with provincial and territorial governments. We are making progress. 900 uh, remote communities across Canada, Mr. Speaker, have, have, got, have benefited from this program. We've laid down 19,000 kilometers of fiber optic cable, Mr. Speaker. The, the current fall economic statement allows a further tax deduction for the laying of fiber optic. Mr. Speaker, we're moving forward. Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Veterans Affairs wrote a newspaper article attacking veteran Sean Bruyer <laughs> despite the fact his department told him that Sean Bruyer's concerns about pension for life were correct, Mr. Speaker. Now Sean Bruyer is in court to clear his name. When a previous minister got into an argument with veterans, he apologized for losing his cool, Mr. Speaker. This is far worse than losing your cool. It was a personal attack. Will the minister rise in this House and apologize to Canadian Forces veteran Sean Bruyer? Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Minister. Mr. Speaker, that, that minister and, in fact, that side of the House has a lot more to apologize for. Let me tell you, for the most appalling and malicious record on our veterans that this House has ever seen, and it will take us some time to get through it, let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, but when you think about men and women returning from Afghanistan only to find benefits and services being shut down, offices being shut down, things being rolled back as they return. The minister walking away from veterans in this house, they have plenty to apologize for. Order. Order. The other member for Foothills will come to order. The honourable member for De order. And also the honourable parliamentary secretary. The Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, when Julian Fantino got into an argument in this building with veterans, he apologized for losing his cool, and at the time the Prime Minister, then the third party leader, said that was insufficient and he should be fired, Mr. Speaker. The Minister's looking at his colleagues looking for approval when he's attacking and not answering the question. 
I'd ask him to look a little further at Mr. Bruyer, who's here. Apologize to this Canadian Forces veteran and don't make him go to court to clear his name. Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Speaker, I stand proudly in front of everyone in this House to say that we have put 10 billion dollars towards new programs and services for our veterans that we have we have reopened every one of those offices that that side of the house closed as veterans returned from Afghanistan they found a government that tried and didn't succeed in balancing a budget on their backs they couldn't get that right their record towards veterans is shameful mr. speaker we will not be apologizing on this side of this house thank you the Honourable Member for Salaberry sur Roy. There was a youth suicide crisis in Nakwasasne in 2011, and since 2015, Nelson White has been trying to get federal funding for an addiction treatment centre set up by and for First Nations. Mr. White has already invested more than $1 million, even if this should be the federal government's responsibility. When will the minister confirm that the government will invest to make the White Pine Healing Lodge a reality? Mr. Speaker, the loss of life from suicide is a tragedy beyond measure. Our government has increased the number of community-led mental wellness teams by 52 since, uh, since uh, becoming government in 2015. We also actively support community-based prevention initiatives such as the Choose Life program. Uh, in, in respect to the specific request uh, by the Honourable Member, I don't have that information, but I will take it under advisement and communicate with the Honourable Member on where we are on that project. Thank you. The Honourable, Deputy de the Honourable Member for Belleau et Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Social acceptability is not an option, it, it, it's an obligation. That's why I participated in the March Against TELUS with uh, more than 300 people from my reading last week. Since 2014, TELUS has been acting in bad faith when it comes to the communications tower. Now they want to impose it in a sensitive, protected environmental area. And what's worse, the minister is ignoring my attempt to speak to the issue and forcing the city to go to the courts. Will the minister listen to the residents of Otterburn Park and finally take some steps to intervene in this matter? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Honourable question from the member under advisement and get back to him uh, personally uh, with an answer. Thank you. Uh, de Lévy the Honourable Member for Lévy Lobinier. Mr. Speaker, every day more than 40,000 people from Lévy Lobinier drive across, across said the Pont de Québec and waste a lot of their precious time in traffic. It's time to build a third link in accordance with the wishes of the majority of the people who live in the greater Quebec City region. On this side of the House, we build bridges. Why are the Liberals denying the evidence and the need for building the third link between Levy and Quebec City? The Honourable Minister for Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I admire his theatrical talent. The talent of that member across the the chamber, especially on a Friday. I would remind him that yesterday I was in Quebec City with Mayor Labon to talk about the projects for the Greater Quebec City region. More than two hundred and eighty seven million dollars in projects that we are currently undertaking in the Quebec City region. We talked about the tramway, we talked about the Pont de Québec, we talked about issues that are important to people of Quebec City. And people in Quebec know something that on this side of the house we support them. <laughs> Order. The Honourable Member for Beauport-Rimolu. Mr. Speaker, the Third Link project is very important to, for the economic development in the region. Now, I'm not uh, mistaken when I say that uh, the Member for Louis Hébert would be going ahead, but uh, Mr. Guibault said he's very much opposed to it. I will give them an opportunity today to uh, tell us if they still support the Third Link project as they said they did on the radio. The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to see the interest uh, of the members opposite in infrastructure after 10 years of little investment in infrastructure. And so Friday we've got some interesting infrastructure-related questions. What I can tell my colleague opposite is that we are 
We welcome Mr. Higilbo on this side of the house as environmental advisor. And what I can say is that yesterday I talked about the third link. When a table, uh, a project will be on the table, we'll discuss it. And for the people who, from Quebec City watching us today, we will always support you. Mm. The honorable member. Well, it's uh, unfortunate that the member for Louis Hébert uh, uh, didn't have an opportunity to answer. At any rate, this third link isn't hypothetical. It's going to be a reality. It's on the CAC's agenda. Can they tell us, yes or no, whether they support it? Mr. Speaker, it's Friday, and I can talk about Weibar, which is doing exceptional work. The Parliamentary Secretary to uh, the Minister of Finance from Louis Hébert talks about the good work we are doing for Canadians, Quebec, and the people of Quebec City. What I'd like to remind to my a member opposite is that uh, I spent two hours with, with Mayor Lebeau yesterday. We talked about issues important to Quebec City. And for the people watching from Quebec City, we will be, uh, we are there for you today. We'll be there for you in the future as well. Uh, member for Niagara Centre. Mr. Speaker, one year ago this week, the government unveiled Canada's first ever national housing strategy. A 10-year, $40 billion plan to give more Canadians a place to call home. The national housing strategy represents a milestone, Mr. Speaker, because it doesn't just invest in housing, it recognizes the federal government's essential role as a key partner in providing Canadians with safe, affordable, accessible housing. Could the minister responsible for housing tell this House what this government has achieved on housing since it came to government in 2015? Good question. Good question. Good minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would first like to thank and congratulate the member for Niagara Centre for his hard work for his constituents. Yesterday, we had one million reasons to celebrate National Housing Day because since 2016, our housing investments have helped a million families across Canada. Yesterday, we also celebrated the first anniversary of the National Housing Strategy, a historic 10-year, $40 billion plan to give more Canadians a safe and affordable home. And today and yesterday and every day, we're happy to celebrate the return of a new housing era, a new renewed level of federal leadership and partnership. Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Mr. Speaker, in spite of recent lofty commitments, this government has increased burden on our businesses. In my writing, Absorbent Products, a three-decade-old family business that manufactures food-grade additives for use in animal feed, has been fighting with CFIA officials for over two years. They have introduced arbitrary new regulations that will imperil not only his operations in Canada, but his ability to export to foreign markets. How can the Liberals claim to be helping business when they're forcing people like absorbent products out of business in my riding? Honourable Minister of Health. Health and safety is my number one priority as Health Minister. I continue to work with CFIA and the regulations are underway and we look forward to reporting the information very soon. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Deputy de Nickel Belt. The Honourable Member for Nickel Belt. Mr. Speaker, access to high, good quality high speed internet is no longer a luxury. It's essential for businesses to develop and be competitive. Canadians need full access to goods and services available in the digital economy, regardless of where they live, in rural regions and isolated regions. Can the Minister for Innovation, Science and Economic Development tell the House what the government is doing to reduce the cost of this digital technology? The nickel belt. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member and a proud Franco-Ontarian for this question. Canadians deserve an equal opportunity in the digital economy, and that's why we signed an important agreement with provincial and territorial ministers to develop a long-term broadband connectivity strategy. Canada has made significant progress by building mobile networks, which are among the fastest in the world, and by deploying a large band internet to communities. Our government is providing basic infrastructure to more than 900 rural and isolated communities. Thank you. F. Airdrie. Well, Mr. Speaker, parents who have lost a child experience an unimaginable grief, and in some cases that grief is added to by the immediate loss of government benefits, which forces them back to work long before they are ready. And these families deserve some compassion and some support from their government. 
but instead that Liberal government shut down debate on the issue and also voted against creating a bereavement leave. Words aren't enough, Mr. Speaker. When will that Liberal government take action to actually show these families the compassion that they deserve? Honourable Minister of Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased and proud to answer this very important question. We know and we feel how difficult it is for families living in difficult circumstances to grow through the hardships that the, our colleague mentioned. That is why we have, since 2015, introduced a number of important changes to the EI system, including a new compassionate care benefit, enhanced benefits, enhanced flexibility for maternal, parental and shared parental benefits to deal exactly with those difficult circumstances with which we must be extremely concerned. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Mirabel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government spends its time boasting about progressive trade agreements that are supposed to protect the right to collective bargaining. Then they do an about face, table back to work legislation, and suspend rules and take all these rights away from workers. And then they wonder why we're so contemptuous. They Say one thing and do the other. Why is that? Oh, Mr. Secretary, to the Minister of Employment. Uh, well, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, uh, you know, if he talks about progressive governments, I think he, he uh, wants me to share with him uh, just what we've done for labour. When we've repealed Bill C uh, 525 and 377, we've amended the Canada Labour Code, given federally regulated uh, employees a right for flexible work. We've strengthened occupational health and safety standards, passed C-65. Uh, we ratified the ILO. We've banned asbestos, both domestic and uh, international trade on asbestos. I think that's pretty progressive, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, since it was elected in 2015, the government has been hesitating and refusing to take action against pimps. For three years now, Bill C-454 received royal assent, and that calls for pimps to serve consecutive prison sentences for their crimes. We need punitive and dissuasive measures to protect our young people. Intervention and prevention aren't enough. But no, this government seems to want to protect those committing the abuse. After dragging their feet for three years, can the Prime Minister finally decide to make a decision to sign the order to bring C-52 into force. The Honourable Government House Leader. I'll, ta do you have I'll take it. Merci, Monsieur le Président, pour la question. Je vais... oh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the question. And I will uh, find an answer and come back to the member. Merci, the Honourable Member for Joliet. Wow. Mr. Speaker, Haiti's been plunged into a dangerous political conflict. Mr. Speaker, Haiti has been plunged into a dangerous political conflict that's causing victims. And this is worrisome for fam Quebec families who are on the verge of being deported there when their safety is, is clearly compromised. The government has suspended removals to Haiti, but only until Sunday. Well. Sunday, that's just around the corner. Clearly, nothing will be resolved by then. Will the government commit to immediately suspending all removals to Haiti, given the unsafe situation there? The Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, uh, the government has demonstrated, and CBSA specifically has demonstrated, uh, their keen sensitivity to the situation. Uh, obviously, CBSA has an obligation to apply Canadian law. Uh, it, uh, it looks to uh, uh, countries around the world that may be implicated in, uh, in serious and dangerous situations uh, to make sure that uh, in the work that they do of, uh, of removing uh, certain people from Canada, they are not removing them into dangerous situations. We've demonstrated that sensitivity, and that sensitivity will continue. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. Campaign 2000's 2018 report card released this week shows that Nunavut's child poverty rate remains the highest in Canada. 34.8% for children under 18 and a staggering 42.5% staggering for children under the age of 6. It cites systemic underfunding of programs and services for Indigenous children as an underlying cause for this, this extreme poverty. 
Will the minister work with the government of Nunavut and provide funding based on actual needs as this government has for First Nations children? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, minister of Social Development. Mr. Speaker, uh, may I first uh, thank and congratulate the member for his heartfelt question and his hard work for, his, uh, for the Nunavut children that he so proudly serves. May I also mention that we take this matter very seriously. Every Inuit child has a right to live outside and grow outside of poverty. That's why we have invested the Canada Child Benefit, which is helping the families of 11,000 children in Nunavut and lifting many of their parents outside of poverty. That's why we're investing $110 million for Indigenous early learning and child care for the benefits of Inuit children. And that's why we're going to continue to work very hard with the member from Nunavut in making sure that every child in his community has the best part. Point of order, the member for Joliet. Yes to Mr. Speaker. I think if you seek it, you shall find unanimous consent to the following motion, especially in view of the minister's response. That this House demand the government immediately suspend all removals of persons to Haiti as long as Global Affairs Canada does not inform the House that it's safe to go back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.